When I was about five years old, I lived in Hawaii with my parents and younger sister. My dad was in the military, and that's where he was stationed at the time. Now let me preface this by saying that I don't remember this specifically, but my mom told me about it years later, and it's definitely relevant, especially looking back at everything that I do remember. There was this closet underneath the staircase in our home, and my sister and I used to play in it all the time. I do remember the closet, and I do remember playing in it a lot, but I don't ever remember this. My mother told me I used to talk to someone in there, someone who wasn't my sister. She said I'd be there, alone, talking to someone. She would ask me, and all I would say that it was a little girl and she was my friend. No big deal, right? Kids have imaginary friends. But after everything, I'm sure it was no imaginary friend. I'm not sure when this started specifically, but I do know this is the first thing that I'm aware of involving this little girl. Now eventually, my family and I moved to the state we live in now. The little girl followed, apparently. We've lived in a total of three places in the state I live in now. Relevant, as I mentioned the three houses over this explanation, as there have been experiences in every place. One day, my aunt showed up to our first place of residence when no one was home. And later that day, my aunt had asked my mom why I was home from school that day. I wasn't. My mum told my aunt this, and she said that she had seen a little girl in one of our windows staring outside, her chin resting in her hands. Her hair was in two braids. Apparently, she looked like me, because my aunt thought it was me. But I was indeed at school that day, and so was my sister. As far as I can recall, that was the only experience involving the girl in that place. I was still fairly young, so I don't remember. Anyway, we moved into the house my grandparents were living in. They had moved to a new house and decided to rent their house to my parents. Now, when we moved into this place, my grandparents had been experiencing things in the house. My grandma had nicknamed the entity they'd been experiencing, Hank. We moved in and started to experience things we hadn't before. Things would go missing or be obviously moved from their previous place. Also, I should mention my mom had experiences involving the little girl over the years before moving to this house. She would hear a little girl's voice saying mommy sometimes and she was sure it was me or my sister. So anyway, we knew that these two entities were different. One was the little girl and one was the one who was moving our things around, Hank. Because while we had experiences with me talking to a little girl, my aunt seeing her and my mom hearing her, we had never experienced our things being moved until we moved into this house. It became kind of a game. When something would go missing, Hank would be scolded by whoever the owner of said item was, and we would ask him to put it back. He was super harmless in general, just liked to move our things. My mom said she would ask for her stuff back and she would find it somewhere she was sure she'd check. Things in the house mainly revolved around Hank. Our things would go missing a lot, and we would ask for them back, and they'd show back up. There were two instances where Hank got angry and lashed out. I personally witnessed this both times, and it was scary, but not in a way I feared for myself. I can't remember which incident happened first, so I'll just tell them in a random order, because my memory is shit, and I can't recall. My dad was a drinker. He also had an anger problem. He was drinking one night and started drunkenly yelling at how Hank needs to stop messing with our stuff. And my dad was standing in the living room where I was as well, just listening to this drunken rant about our ghost and all of a sudden, one of the light bulbs in the ceiling light blew, like exploded and shattered glass in the room. Another incident was that my grandma was over visiting and she and my mom were talking in the kitchen while I was in there as well about Hank. And my grandma mentioned that maybe we should contact someone to get rid of the entity. And out of nowhere, a picture that had been sitting on a shelf behind my grandma just falls to the ground, nearly hitting her. Now, Hank is just kind of a side part of the whole story with the little girl, but felt the need to include him, as he does eventually follow us from this house to the house my parents are currently living in. 
My mom actually told Hank to take care of the little girl ghost that had been following us since Hawaii. And I guess when we moved from this house to the one my parents currently live in, he followed us because he felt he needed to stay with the little girl. He felt the need to stay with me. Anyway, one more experience from this house involving the little girl. I heard her voice. Probably not the first time, but this is the first time I remember hearing it, very audibly. I was walking through the living room to the kitchen. On the way, I had to pass by the little space that had the tiny hallway, bathroom and two bedrooms. They were all bunched together and they were kind of situated right off between the living room and kitchen. On the walk through the living room, right as I passed by the tiny hallway, I heard a little girl's voice say, Mommy. My sister didn't sound like that and she didn't call my mom that. My mom was in the kitchen and my dad was at work. It wasn't scary, it was just kind of like, oh, there she is. So eventually, we moved to the house my parents are currently living in, and Hank and the little girl followed. Now on to everything I experienced in this house. Because I was older, I do remember everything that happened, but I honestly couldn't tell you if this was all the little girl or not. I'm only sure about one of these instances being her, as I heard her voice. The other times, I can't be sure. One was not something I experienced, but my dad saw this one night when we went to check on me as I slept. I slept with the door open because my cat liked to come in and out of my room, so I kept my door open for her. My parents' room was directly across from mine, and my sister's room just next to mine. So he just peeked his head into my room to check on me as he was coming to bed, and he saw I was asleep, laying on my side with my knees bent. He said he saw someone crouch down on the bed, sitting just behind my legs, their knees pulled to their chest. When he looked back at me a second later, it was gone. One time I was sitting in my parents' room, sitting in the computer chair as I played games on the computer. I had the door shut and I was alone in the room, not even any pets in the room with me. Out of nowhere, I felt the chair lurch forward as though someone had shoved or even kicked the back of the chair while I was in it. One time I was laying in bed on my right side and I felt a hand slide underneath my pillow from behind me. I didn't look back to see because I honestly was too scared of what I might see. One time I was laying in the living room on the couch at night crying because my hip was hurting and I heard a little girl's voice say, it's okay. I knew it was the little girl because I felt so comforted and calm. I wasn't scared at all. One time, I was sitting in the living room on the couch, and my living room was set up so that if I was sitting on the couch, I could turn my head left and see directly down the hallway, where my parents' room was at the end on the left, and my room was at the end on the right. I can't remember if I had turned my head, or if I was sitting on the couch with my legs on the couch as well, so that I was completely facing the hallway while I watched TV. And I saw a white figure with its head bent down, move from my room to my parents' room. I haven't had any experiences since moving out, so I think the little girl finally decided to stay with my parents instead of me. I welcomed her. I voiced out when I left that she could come with me, but I've never felt her presence, so I think she thought she would stay with my parents, Hank, and whatever other entities are in that house. I've had the occasional sleep paralysis involving shadow people at least two to three times per year. When I was younger, I just froze, but still tried to fight back. In dreams, if you tried fighting them, your fists would slide off their face. It's hard to explain. Fighting them and breaking out the paralysis involves the same thing. The feeling you get is like pushing two sides of the same magnet polarity. Hitting them could be as simple as changing the way you punch the back fist instead of straight. The quick things throw them off. Breaking out of paralysis is like pulling away from a magnet. Requires more strength, physical and mental. Eventually, you can predict the paralysis before it hits. Now, to the shadow people. Not sure what they are, only what I observed. They can take any shape, not just shadow and attack in dreams too. 
They like to take the shape of a dead loved one to get a reaction from you. It's to feed off your emotions. Before the paralysis hits, if you're awake, it feels like a warm wind hitting you. Then, it tries to hold you down or bear hug you. Obviously, scaring the crap out of you and feeding the things. At first, trying to fight back was frustrating. But when I finally was able to move, I tried to wrestle what was holding me off. It didn't take a form, but when I grabbed and pushed, I could feel a forearm and wrists. During one of the wrestle fest in a dream, I got so angry that I put that my hands started to burn. They flamed blue and the thing started to screech. It turned shadow and fled out my door. The flames spread all over me. I could feel the heat, but it didn't burn me. Did I freak out? Nope. I chased it out the door and bear hugged until the screaming stopped. Since then, when they attack in dreams, I like to grab an arm or throat and burn away. It's gotten so that whenever they attack, it's only in groups now. No more singles. The scream sounds like a small dinosaur from the old movies. I was asleep on my back when I felt one coming. Came straight through the bottom of the bed and grabbed me. We fought and I ended up choking it from behind. Stood up and went for the throat burn. At this point it's screeching when my mom comes out of her room. Mom has been dead for years, so I say, don't know who you are, but my mom's been dead a long time. I'm standing behind the first one, squeezing, making it scream. When my mom starts to shake, scream, and turns into one of these things. I toss the first thing into the other and told them to get the hell out. Not welcome here. Dream ends, but that brings me to my next point. Ever see a loved one while dreaming and they're just evil, hurtful? Recently deceased who don't miss you? Try to hurt you or make you feel worse? It ain't them. The shadow people can take any shape, remember, but that raw emotion you feel thinking it's a loved one attacking you feeds their form. It may take practice, but try fighting back and remember it's possible to break out of the paralysis. What you see may be an imposter, so don't lose control of your emotions. I wanted to share a few UFO encounters I've had. The first was when I was about 11 and driving home with my dad. I looked out the window and saw a ship. It was shaped more like a small city, black with multiple spires. I told my dad and he saw it as well and gunned it home. The odd part was his reaction which is connected to the next encounter. I asked about the ship and he went ape shit, started screaming about nothing being there and not seeing it, even though he described it when I pointed it out. Fast forward to about four years ago, makes me around 34 years old. At work at the hotel, the housekeeper calls me over. It's Veterans Day, so I figure she wants me to check out the parade. She points out a white sphere in the sky. We stare at it, and it moves at insane speed and then splits into six smaller spheres. I tell her congratulations on her first UFO sighting. It keeps moving around the parade, and I tell her not to worry, it's probably just observing. Thing is... When I asked later if any more weird stuff came out, I got the same reaction. Total freak out, screaming about not seeing anything, and it's not real. Like, if the mind can't handle the situation, it melts down. This final one is a bit more interesting. I had let my dogs out at night for potty break. Then, a head count as they came back inside. Before I went in, I noticed a star bigger than the others. Not being a runner, I stayed put. It got closer and I got a better look. It was a four-pointed star with mini points about the size of a pressure cooker, all pulsating different colours. I decided to try telepathy. No, I didn't do anything fancy, like cross my legs or om. Just thought in my head like when you do a grocery list. Asked if it meant harm. Give me red for no, green for yes. Got a red for no. Asked if it came from the stars, it turned green. Asked if it was here for recon, again, green. Finally, thought, okay, 
you can be on your way, and it flew higher and further. My point on the last one is to try and stay calm. Might scare you a bit, but it's the best way to remember what you saw. I didn't get any missing time or the usual stuff like strange markings. Just an odd encounter. To start, I work downtown at a hotel and I've had two BEK experiences that I'd like to share. The first was on my walk to my bus stop from work. It's a good eight blocks. When I'm waiting at the crosswalk and I noticed a teen girl crossed the way staring. So I slightly turn and she seems normal, pixie haircuts. Your average teen except her eyes are black. The whole thing, no white at all. Here's the strangest part. When I looked, she started to panic, looking for somewhere to run. As soon as the light's green, she sprints away. I found it odd that the BEK panicked. It's usually the other way round. Till this day, I kick myself that I didn't follow. But the only thing I was worried about was missing the dang bus. The other experience happened at work. We have three laundry rooms for guests. One day, a female guest asked for my help. She had on a gym clothes, so I informed her about our 24-hour gym. She made small talk, but the pupils of her eyes were off. Like a lava lamp changing shape quickly. Just the black part. Nothing felt wrong or scary. Just the eyes were strange. Googled like crazy, but could not find contacts with this effect. They're all static, not moving. Her pupils moved like a lava lamp, or Rorschach's mask, if you will. I wonder if any of you guys have heard of different types of BEK or anything similar. So I've had quite a few lucid dreams over my life, and almost all of them have been a good experience. But the one I had just now wasn't so good. In fact, it was terrifying. So I woke up in my room as I normally do, in all the lucid dreams I've had. But this time, I was in some dark, twisted reality, and everything was just really fucked up. I instantly knew I was dreaming, but I decided to still check anyway, so I started counting my fingers. And as soon as I finished my hands, they disappeared, and they didn't come back. My body was also moving really slowly, as if I was really sick and old. It was a horrible feeling. So anyways... I decided I'd had enough and tried waking myself up by closing my eyes and tensing my body. This time it didn't work, and I was stuck. I started to panic a bit and started pacing up and down my room. I even threw myself down the stairs, but that also didn't work. At this point, I just got fed up and went back to bed to try to sleep it off, but something was next to me. I didn't know what it was and was too scared to confront it, and then this thing climbed on top of me and was sitting on my back. It felt really small, kind of like a small animal or a child. It was really heavy, and somehow I managed to get myself out and pace out of my room. I tried throwing myself down the stairs again, but still couldn't wake up. At this point, I didn't know how much time had passed, but it felt like hours, and I started thinking to myself, what if this isn't a dream, and I actually died in my sleep? and woke up in some fucked up alternate reality. Then, I noticed there were some new doors in my room that led to different rooms and long corridors. But the doors had an eerie feeling about them, so I didn't want to explore. Towards the end, I started to choke on something. I think it was my own spit, and it was really irritating. I tried clearing my throat, but it just made it worse. The weird thing was that I could still breathe properly, and I was choking at the same time. It was such an uncomfortable feeling, and I started to worry that I might actually be choking in real life. Some time passed, and I eventually woke up. Turns out, I was choking on my spit. As of right now, it's 2am, and I'm too shaken to go back to sleep, as I might get it again. Does anyone know what I just experienced, or had anything similar happen to them? I would really appreciate it if someone could explain it to me.
I used to be the singer in a punk metal band called Scotch Tapeworm. We never really made it big, but we had a few popular gigs around the Minnesota area. We even warmed up the stage for a few big names, which I won't name drop here. But I wanted to tell you about why I quit and why there are no songs from our band online anymore. The short version is that someone stole the music in me. Yeah, that sounds weird. Let me explain. We'd had a streak of good luck and we were feeling that our newest song could be the way to a record deal if it reached the right people. We managed to fund a music video and we'd worked hard on it for about two months. We talked to a whole bunch of reaction channels on YouTube and sent out a whole bunch of previews. Overall, it looked positive. We even thought about skipping the middleman and going straight to recording our own studio album. Needless to say, I was living and breathing music during those days. Spent and deflated it was going to be our big one. But it didn't quite work out that way. It all started with an email. One of the reaction channels had a copyright claim. In a matter of hours, we got over a dozen similar emails. We challenged each and every one of them, but it didn't matter. The claimer was adamant. This was their content. Of course, it was nonsense. Some shell company that we'd never heard of. There we were, the entire band, ready to party and watch the reactions to our music. Beers, snacks, and two hours of pre-partying, and then we were all stuck answering angry emails. It fucking sucked. After that, we made all our videos private. It was the only way to make sure no one else got paid for the traffic we generated. We tried to get a hold of the mods, but nothing happened. We got stuck in automated response after automated response. And we didn't have enough of a Twitter presence to get someone to answer our DMs. So all our momentum started running out and spent and deflated, just sat there with a handful of Spotify listens. Then one night, I got a notification on my phone. One new comment on one of our videos. What the fuck? All our videos were private. And there it was. A single comment on spent and deflated. It just said, so good, and linked to some kind of number. Spam. Of course it was fucking spam. At that point, I was about to give up. I threw my phone across the room, probably waking up the neighbour. The next few days, the band was having trouble. People weren't showing up for rehearsal, and our drummer was even talking about quitting. Much like the song, they were spent and deflated. We tried to work up the energy to find solutions, but it all just felt like the world was against us. We had this fucking banger of a song, but we just couldn't get it out there. It felt so weird getting desperate over this, like the public was doing us a favour, hearing our song. Is that what music is nowadays? One night, I had a bit too much to drink, and I ended up spending the night with my phone in my bed. I just laid there, half asleep, waking up from time to time to swipe right on Tinder. I ended up listening to YouTube, and by some drunken thoughts, I checked out the comments again. I decided I wanted to mess with whoever posted that, so I checked it out. Turns out, it wasn't just some random phone number, it was some kind of WhatsApp number. I gave it a call. To my surprise, an actual human answered. Is this from Scotch Tapeworm? The woman on the other end said. Well, yeah, I said. Again, deflated. My anger just ran out of me. Yeah, I'm the singer, I continued. How? How did you leave that comment? We collect good music from smaller channels. Would you be interested in a collaboration? Y yeah, I said. Hell yeah. We worked out the details. I was to come see them at their recording studio the upcoming weekend on my own. I didn't even question that I'd set up a meeting with someone I never even asked the name of, after having rung a single tone to an unknown number at two in the morning on a Thursday. I was drunk. The next day, I was about to cancel the whole thing. I'd made a note in my calendar, and it took me a solid hour to even make out the words I'd misspelled. Still, there it was. Time and a place, clear as day. I had an entire day to get my hangover out of my system and just cancel but I never came around to it. Instead, I figured we had nothing to lose. 
So yeah, I just went on with my day and got ready for the meeting with these mystery fans. I know, it sounds crazy, but I live in an area where crime is something that happens to other people. I met with this woman I talked to on the phone outside a cafe downtown. She seemed perfectly pleasant to talk to, and I didn't get any weird vibes. If anything, she was kind of into me, despite her being a few years older than me. She bought me a latte, and we took a walk back to the studio. She introduced herself as Eve, and that her family owned a private studio. She wanted to talk to me, show me around, and if things went well, they could help us with future recordings. It sounded great, and I have to admit, I was getting excited. No longer drunk on vodka, I was getting drunk on attention and future prospects. Their property was just off the highway, but we took a shortcut through the forest to get there. I tried to memorise the path, but I'm not known for my amazing attention span. Soon, we walked for about 35 minutes. The house just seemed to appear out of nowhere. It was this large two-storey house, along with a big attic with a round window. There were two cars on the driveway, a tyre swing and plenty of open space. Hell, on the far side was a gazebo that looked recently built. It was nice, and I'd never heard of that place before. Welcome, she said, to 65 Hatchet Lane. She told me her kids were out for the day, and that her husband would be back within a few hours. In the meantime, she showed me around. The house was beautiful, but I got the feeling that it was a bit too new. Like someone had just moved it. There were no little imperfections that came from someone living in a place for too long. No rough edges, so to speak. It was immaculate and artificially homey. Still, I figured that was just what their family was like. She took me down to see the studio. That thing was definitely new. There was an isolation booth in one of the corners that was more or less covered in the plastic out of the box. Some of the instruments in the live room looked unused. It all smelled like plastic rather than coffee and cigarettes, so I knew no one had been down here before me. You'll be our first client, she said, our first collaborators. Fair enough, I thought. Still, if you have three guitars valued at a total of $36,000, you probably aren't doing this just for fun. She asked me to do a trial in the live room, just to get a feel for the place. I didn't mind, and stepped in. I sang a few notes from Spent and Deflated, and got a thumbs up from the control room. Sounds great, she said with a smile. Hold on, while I get the others. I should have gotten out, there and then. But I didn't. How could I have known? Twenty minutes passed, and I decided to stretch my legs and check out the mix table. The door was locked. I checked and checked again, but it was locked tight. I was stuck down there with all the expensive equipment. I checked my phone, but there was no reception. We were more than eight feet underground after all, and this place didn't seem all that accessible. I started banging on the door and window, but there was nothing. The place was soundproof. Twenty minutes turned to an hour, and an hour turned into two. I'm not a claustrophobic person, but after spending that long locked in any location, anyone would start to feel cramped up. I was screaming, pounding the door, pacing back and forth. I tried not to hyperventilate. I tried throwing a chair through the window, but it didn't even make a dent. Bulletproof, soundproof, this was a fucking bunker. At some point, I nodded off in the corner. I must have slept for at least two hours before I woke up. It was close to midnight, when someone started flashing the lights. I opened my eyes. The entire studio was dark, but I could see them in the control room. At least a dozen people, cramped together. Their eyes reflecting the red from the mixed table diodes. Some small, some big. I had no sense of how tall they were or how old. I couldn't even see who was Eve and who wasn't. In the red lights, I saw a grey hand reached forward and grab a microphone. There was a crackle in the live, live room. Sing. That wasn't Eve. It sounded more like a crow trying to call from a humanish sound. The grey hand had these long white nails like talons. Sing. The eyes. They didn't blink. 
She was holding down the microphone button, breathing heavily. It felt like she was filing the room with a warm breath, choking me with her unwavering look. I tried to just sing, but it was like having a rock in my chest. I couldn't draw breath. I couldn't think. Fucking sing! I tried to take a breath, but I'd started to sniffle. I was holding back tears, and I hadn't even realised it. I was so fucking scared. I was being kidnapped, and these strangers were making me jump through hoops. I had no idea what to expect anymore. I tried to sing the first lines. Six minutes to midnight, hunger, unsated, I began. Bathing in misery, I've created. You're not singing! It was no longer a voice. It was a growl, a car, some kind of bird-like noise. There were clicking noises coming from the other bystanders in the room. Sing! I tried four more times. Over and over, I broke down. I cried. I pleaded. I tried, but I was too scared. The room was completely dark, and all I could see was those red eyes. They still didn't blink. A few of them moved in and out of the room. One of them ran up the stairs, but there were never less than a dozen of them. On the sixth try, I finally managed to get the right tone. I tapped into something primal, something angry, like a cornered animal. Six minutes to midnight, hunger unsated, bathing in misery, I've created. Turn your backs, traitors, one at a time. Don't think we can see that you're spent and deflated. I screamed my voice out. This was the goddamn performance of a lifetime, and all who were there to see were on the other side of that glass, staring me down. The red eyes didn't flinch, but they nodded. Good, the voice said. Good. The door opened. A slight reflection from the eyes towered above me. Whoever stepped in was taller than the door and could barely fit in the room. They just stared down at me and I could see the outline of their teeth. Clawed hands reached for me. I backed myself into a corner, my voice too torn to scream. Something grabbed my long hair and step by step, I was dragged out, kicking and screaming. I thought that was it. That was me dying right there, never having been on a proper stage. I was brought up the stairs, out the door, and into the woods. The moonlight showed me the outline of my attacker. This tall and gangly man, roughly twice my height. He had this strange beak-like face, and his eyes almost shone from the moonlight. I tried to get away, but he had this mechanical grip on my hair and head. The more I struggled, the more warmth I could feel from my blood running down my neck. Finally, he let go of me. As I turned around and laid flat on my back, he pushed me down, his hand large enough to cover my entire chest. His long face revealed a toothless mouth, stinking with ammonia. I stopped fighting. He had me. In a swift motion, he covered my entire face with his mouth. I started to fight him off. I was choking, my lungs contracting and trying to close themselves off. I could feel my fingers going numb as my heartbeat rose in my chest. Then, darkness. The next day, I woke up on the side of the highway, covered in booze with a bad cough. I called the police, barely able to speak a word. The next hour was a flurry of faces, questions and cars. I told them about the house at 65 Hatchet Lane only to be told there was no such dress. I tried to get them to follow the trail we walked, but I couldn't remember where it was. One by one, they all assured me that no such place existed, and that if it did, it must have been somewhere completely different from what I was describing. There were a few witnesses that had seen Eve, but no one had ever seen her before. Within a day, it was obvious that we'd hit a dead end. Since then, I haven't been able to sing. My voice crackles and makes me cough, but worst of all, I can't find any tunes. I can't even keep to a rhythm. I've stopped tapping my feet and banging my head, like my body just no longer gets it. It feels like a phantom limb, just out of reach. I can't even fake it, it's just not there. I want my music back. I never want to see that beak-faced man, but I just, 
I can't live like this. Please, if someone knows anything, let me know. Back in June, I was walking my dog Arnie when I came upon a yard sale. It was a bit out of a place as it was one of the fancier neighbourhoods and I've never actually seen a yard sale anywhere near there before. There were two men, both in their 40s, talking to customers and trying to keep up appearances. The front yard was littered with cheap plastic tables, each one cluttered with various knickknacks. Every table had some sort of themed item. Some of the items looked strangely personal. Things like old teddy bears and colouring books. I walked past tables labelled kitchen, bedroom, bathroom and study. At the very end was a smaller table just called Christy. The Christy table was the epitome of 90s nostalgia. A few old My Little Pony toys, cassette tapes and sealed plastic bags with various random toys for a book. There were old jackets and shirts, all with the same size. Also, a few no-spill cups and a pair of crutches. Child-sized. I tried not to see the story the items told. Instead, I dug into the meat of the table. The massive collection of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle collectibles. Christy had it all. The Technodrome, the Party Wagon, the Foot Cruiser and Shredder's Drill. Pretty much all the action figures. Bebop, Rocksteady, Krang, Splinter, Foot Soldiers, April, The Rat King, Casey Jones. Every character I could even vaguely remember, and then some. As an old Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle fan, I wanted to get it all and put it on a shelf in my man cave. Maybe put up some RGB lights. I just couldn't imagine the price. Cowabunga, said one of the men holding the sail. Not bad, huh? No, this is very thorough. Some of this looks almost new. Christy didn't play much. She just liked the company, he sighed. Are you interested? hundred bucks for the lot. A hundred? Seriously? That was insane. One hundred bucks for the entire collection? Some of it as close to mint in box as you could get. Well, without the box. She would have wanted a fan to have it, he smiled. You got the right look about you. All proceeds go to charity. In that case, I said... I insist on 150. You drive a hard bargain. We shook on it. I came around with my car and picked up the whole lot. The other man was openly weeping on the lawn, clutching the Donatella toy. Apparently, it had been a favourite. It looked like the only thing that had been played with. I insisted on him keeping it, but he forced himself to part with it. Just put him up forward, he said. He's important. I begrudgingly agreed. Leonardo was my favourite, but I wasn't going to argue. I bought two shelves, some RGB lights and a timer. I wanted the entire collection to light up at night automatically. I'd seen a poster as well, and if I framed it all just right, it would look amazing. Arnie, my golden retriever dash and mix, was beyond himself. My enthusiasm was contagious, and he picked up on it instantly. I could barely put the shells up with him brushing up against my legs and asking to play. All in all, it took me about two hours to fill the shelves, and there was still a box of things left. Mostly kitchen stuff like faded plastic mugs and plates. But there, at the bottom of the box, was something I'd never seen before. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle Ouija board. It was clearly not official merchandise. It was hand-painted, but whoever had made it had been meticulous. They traced the turtle's font over every letter and number, and used the correct colour scheme. Instead of the no in the top right corner, it said, no way. Instead of goodbye, it said, later dude. And instead of yes, was the ever-present cowabunga. The thing was built to last. It was made of a solid slab of oak and had layers upon layers of finish. Next to it, at the very bottom, was a planchette that looked like one of Donatello's gadgets. There was even a sort of magnifying glass in the middle. All in all, it looked like it was made with great care. Still, it wasn't official merchandise, yet there was something about it. It was the kind of curio that just begged to be displayed, so I hung it up on the wall in place of a poster. Once those RGB lights kicked in, it looked fantastic. 
150 bucks was a steal. The following weekend, I had a few friends over for dinner. The new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle shells were an instant talking point. The figures were all taken down and looked at, and even jokingly played with. Bruce rearranged them, putting Leonardo in the front, like I'd wanted to do all along. He's the leader, Bruce argued. Donatello just does machines. But once the talk about the show and the endless reboot subsided, one question remained on everyone's mind. What the hell was the deal with the Ouija board? It was passed around and examined. Admired, even. Everyone agreed that it was very well made. Sturdy, with some weight to it. Unlike most of the plastic crap sold back then. It was Jamie that suggested we take it out for a test spin. She wanted to ask the turtles some questions. We were about four drinks and a hefty dinner in, before we all decided it was a great idea. Arnie wasn't as convinced, quietly pacing back and forth with the tail between his legs. I thought he was just anxious because of all the strange people, but now that I look back on it, I think there was something more to it. There were seven of us huddled around a small coffee table. Jamie was the first to ask if there were any heroes in a half shell there. Bruce was clearly pushing towards Cowabunga. There were a few other rounds with questions like, did the Shredder get you? And what do you think of the Michael Bay adaptation? And everyone around the table just laughed it off. Kenneth tilted the table, but didn't even manage to move the planchette. He did manage to spill Jamie's drink, though. Once the laughter died down, it was Grace that asked the first actual question. It took us all a bit by surprise. Why did you make this board? she asked. We all put a finger on the planchette, some more interested than others. Jamie and Bruce had both mentally checked out, while Grace and Kenneth were all in. Morgan and Jody didn't seem too bothered, and I just didn't know what to make of it. I'd never used one of these before. Then the planchette moved. It was a sudden, twitchy movement. Even Bruce seemed surprised. It jumped to A. Grace grasped and shook her head. Then it moved to later, dude. A later, dude, smiled Jamie. I don't get it. It usually says goodbye there, said Grace. So, a goodbye? Did you do this as a goodbye? Jamie, who sat next to Kawabunga, took a drink. The rest of us, all in awkward positions, saw the planchette move towards her. The answer was a clear yes. Well, a Kawabunga. As a goodbye, I nodded, thinking back to the child-sized crutches and the no-spill cups. It made sense. Later that night, I was cleaning up the party. Arnie started freaking out. He was hiding behind the couch, making all sorts of odd complaining noises. I was putting away dishes in the dishwasher when I heard something thud from the nearby hallway. I put away the last wine glass and checked it out. At first, I didn't notice it. It took me a few moments to realise Leonardo had fallen from the shelf. I just put him back up, not thinking twice about it. He was the leader after all. Of course he should fall first. I couldn't get Arnie out from under the couch. We skipped his walk that night. The following morning, Leonardo was face down on the floor again. I was barely awake when I went down to pick him up. There was a creaking noise and I froze like a deer in headlights. Then... The shells came crashing down. It was sudden and violent. The bottom shelf thumped down straight across my shin bones, and the top shelf almost shot out from the wall, leaving the screws behind. The technodrome poked me in the eye, and the party wagon almost knocked one of my front teeth out. My heart was pounding, and Arnie was barking his heart out. This was completely out of nowhere. Arnie rushed in and licked my face, pacing back and forth. I just sat there, covered in bruises and plastic. In front of me, leaning against the wall, was the Donatello toy. I can't even recall seeing him fall. Had he been sitting there the entire time? I put the shells up again, reinforced with better screws. I fixed the lights, put the Ouija board back up, and triple tested it. They were solid enough for me to hang from, so this wouldn't happen again. Still, I couldn't shake the feeling that it hadn't been an accident. While my bruises came and went, I started getting paranoid. Every time I walked past the shelf, it felt like the toys were watching me. 
I could swear the wheels of the party wagon were turning by themselves, and I could hear plastic clicking. Maybe my head was playing tricks with me, but it seemed things were moving, albeit just a little. An arm twisting, a leg turning, painted white eyes staring at me. Also, I could have sworn I put Donatello in the back, but he always seemed to end up in the front. That same night, Arnie refused to even enter the hallway, and honestly, it was all getting to me. That shelf full of collectibles was started to feel threatening rather than comforting. I considered packing it all up and putting it into storage, or just selling it, but that Ouija board just made me think twice about it. Eventually, I decided to take a second look at the Ouija board. I brought it in the planchette into the living room, put it down and looked over it thoroughly. I noticed there were some scuffs in the pane in the corner. The wood underneath looked old, like really old. I had no idea. I put a piece of paper over the surface and started tracing with a pen. You know, when you gently brush from side to side to see if there were any patterns in the grooves underneath. They were just painted over. There was a second board underneath, but it had been painted over. The words were some sort of foreign symbols and there were more letters. I didn't recognise them or the order, but I think it was some sort of acrylic. There were also a few words placed in irregular spots that I didn't know what they meant. What do I do with you? I didn't even think about what I was saying. I have a bad habit of talking out loud. As if to respond, there was a strange chugging sound from the bathroom. I almost flipped the board as I got up and hurried in there. The toilet was backed up, and water had begun to swell up. Cursing to myself, I plunged my hand down the drain to find what's plugged in, but there was nothing there. It had to be a piping issue. I considered fetching my tools, but as the foul-smelling basement water was spilling over, I decided I'd drain the pipes first. I opened the basement door and had to take a step back. The smell was so bad. Arnie was so worried but he couldn't force himself to follow me down the stairs. He twisted and turned, stepping back and forth and tiptoeing the way the concerned dogs do. Maybe he was just reflecting what I was feeling, and I was feeling nothing but concern. Stay there, Arnie, I called out. I'm just checking the filter. I'd had issues with the pipes before, but that was usually because of freezing. This was June. Nothing freezes in mid-June. There was an inch of water all over the basement floor. I turned on the lights and the shadows grew longer. The smell was overwhelming. I could hear Arnie step back and forth upstairs, worried. It was obvious there was where the issue was coming from. There was a tea section where something foul was leaking out, similar to a thick black mud. I got my wrench and tightened the pipe, but the seal was pretty much broken. Drop by drop, it just plopped into the water. There was a pile of that black mud right underneath the pipe, large enough that I'd need a shovel to pick it all up. And even then, it would take a couple of scoops. I was putting all my weight behind the wrench to seal the pipe when Arnie started going ballistic upstairs. I hurried up the stairs and saw Arnie crawled back under the couch, staring down the hallway. I followed his eyes. The shelves were empty. On the living room floor was the Ouija board, with the planchette held over a casual, later dude. I walked into the hallway to check it out for myself. The RGB lights were still a strong green. My bedroom door moved. Every single toy was spread out through the room. Their bodies were facing me, but their heads were turned away. The back of all those childhood heroes, breaking their necks not to look at me. It was unsettling. I couldn't even begin to process how this was happening, and frankly, I was running out of explanations. I picked up my car keys, knocking over April O'Neil. I had every intention of just grabbing Arnie, starting my car, and getting out of there. There was a creaking sound as the basement door opened. The green RGB lights burst into white and then burned out. There was something foul smelling in the hallway. I could hear something dripping onto the floor. It wasn't tall, a child at most, covered in a black goo and sickly thin. I couldn't even see the skin, but the waist was so thin I could put a single hand around it and have my fingertips touch. 
Mechanically, it lurched forward through the hallway. It was heading towards me. I backed up against the wall, feeling for the window with my right hand. I couldn't find the lock, fumbling in the dark. I couldn't keep my eyes off the blob. It moved with stiff arms and legs, not bending a joint. As it bent down to pick something up, a part of the black goo slouched off to show a flawless porcelain white skin. A pair of black eyes and an unmoving face. A neutral smile, as if painted on. It picked up the Donatello doll. There was an eerie moaning sound coming from it, like someone trying to breathe through a closed mouth. Then the face crackled. It broke, giving way to an unhinged plastic-like jaw with nothing but a black void underneath. The jaw hung loose, moving, trying to form a sentence. To say something. This was an either-or moment. This thing could kill me. I just felt it. It would kill me and no one but Arnie would know the truth. It could burst forward and my heart would just stop. It was already beating out of my chest and my head wasn't getting enough oxygen to think. I was paralysed. The unhinged jaw bobbed up and down, but no words came. Was it trying to laugh? A dripping little hand reached for me. I was up against the wall. How? Then a bark. A loud, violent, angry bark. The kind of bark you don't expect from a dashund mix. I felt the cold radiating off the gooey fingertips. There was a sudden burst of light. I was blinded. The bedroom lights were back on. No good. No reaching hands. No trace of what had happened here even showed, except for a few dark blue footprints that were quickly fading away. All the action figures were spread out across the room, all facing different directions. I just sank to the ground, sobbing, as Arnie ran up to comfort me. That brave little friend of mine, it had taken every inch of courage in him, but it might have just saved my life. The Donatello toy was gone. Was she just here to get her favourite back? Since that night, nothing else has happened. The backed up toilet pretty much fixed itself. The RGB lights work again, and all the figurines stay as I put them. I thought about just throwing them all away, but despite all this, there's a part of me that loves them. Leonardo even gets to stay up front, now that Donatello is gone. I've read up on the family I bought these from. They were sort of easy to find. I know the guy who does their plumbing, and he hears a lot of stuff. Apparently, their younger sister, Christine, or Christy, had died back in the 90s to a rare blood disease. She'd been cremated. No one had the heart to clear out her room for almost 30 years. Her older brothers had been selling her things after the house was flooded a few weeks prior, back in May. Her ashes had fallen off her shelf and mixed with the rainwater, making this weird ash-like black goo. The goo got stuck in the pipes. Actually, most of her old things were covered in the stuff. They just washed it off and sold it all as is on the yard sale, trying desperately to get that house and everything in it sold as soon as possible. Maybe they figured it was time to move on, no matter the cost. I don't know what to make of it. I think something happened to those two. I think there was a reason they were so upset, and why they wanted to get rid of it all so cheap. And the Ouija board? Well, I still have it. I think it was some attempt to give Christy a proper goodbye, or a way to find her way back to the family from the other side. Now it doesn't do anything but respond with later dude, no matter what you ask. But I have this creeping sensation that it doesn't just mean goodbye. I think it really means later. I think this thing never really says goodbye. It sticks with you. I think it will, literally, see me later. My brother and I are identical twins. We've experienced our share of strange things throughout our lives, but for some reason, this always slips my mind. Probably because we were so young. This was an almost daily occurrence from four years old to about nine, maybe. Anyway, when we were younger, we basically used to see shadow people running by in the corner of our eyes all the time. It's crazy, because I never thought I'd write about it, because it doesn't bother me and I do believe in another possible dimension. What I'm saying is, I'm not looking for answers per se, 
I'm just sharing my peculiar story. We grew up as Christians, so every time my brother and I would tell our mother what we saw, a shadow, she would remind us that if it didn't scare us, it was a good spirit. If it scared us, we should rebuke it in the name of Christ. What I find so funny about this is that I remember my mother reminding us this all the time. Our mother had to actually come up with an elaborate reasoning behind us seeing dark figures running by. It actually became so frequent as a child, I could remember that I hated to look at certain darker areas and places, and would try to take creepier parts of the house out of my peripheral vision to avoid seeing them. And I can remember, when I'd look, it would actually frustrate me that I'd see a shadow run by because I'd think, see, I knew it. I thought I'd always see them. So did my brother. But neither of us see them anymore. At all. It's weird to think I even almost forgot it used to happen, because it was such a common occurrence, in retrospect. These days, the closest we come to seeing them is when we trip on LSD and we see usual trippy shadows. But that only reminds us of the shadow people. It's not the same, though. As a kid, these weren't just trippy shadows moving. They would just straight up look like dark legs and arms, running right by our peripheral vision. Same for my brother. I'd also add that we've had cases where we've seen them back to back. As in, I would see one, and so would he, without either of us knowing we both just saw the figure. Then we'd talk about it later. One time, I ran to my mother with the usual, Mom, I saw one again. This one scared me. But it was the kind I normally saw. A peripheral paranormal, I guess. But at around the same time, my brother was all alone sitting by the fireplace. He had no clue I had just seen one and was telling our mother. He just felt uneasy and remembers looking to his left and seeing a huge shadow sitting as if it were next to him. He remembers thinking, that's just my shadow from the fire. He moved his torso down and the shadow went the opposite way. He got a little freaked out and lifted his back to go the other way. And from what he said, the shadow didn't move. He just noped and sprinted to my mother. I never disregarded the story simply because I used to deal with the same thing and also because he ran to my mother and told her what happened moments after I told her I had just seen one at a separate section of the house. As an adult, I remember bringing this up to our mother and asking if she remembers us doing this and she got wide-eyed and said, yeah, that shit was scary. And it was hilarious hearing her tell me as an adult that she was terrified and all that good spirit, bad spirit stuff was horseshit. She just didn't know what else to tell her creepy twins. I'm going to start off by prefacing that over these last few months, I lost two family members. One being my grandpa and another being my family's seven-month-old kitten to FIP. After the kitten's death, my sister decided to adopt another one from the shelter. She was a sweet girl, and we had her for a month and a half until today. Today, I got home from school, and the way my room is placed is that I'm at the end of the hall, so I can see into my parents' bedroom. I had a friend over at this time, so we were just hanging out with my door open. I have another cat that's one and a half years old, and they usually just play together. So when I heard meows from the other room, I wasn't alarmed. However, when I looked, I saw a light was suddenly on in my parents' bedroom. I slightly panicked, since I knew I couldn't have someone over, so I immediately went to check on the source. All I saw was the lamp on my parents' headboard and my older cat sitting by the bed. I shrugged it off, thinking it was just her meowing and maybe the light just wasn't turned off all the way. I turned the light off and bring my old cat to my room. I heard nothing else from my parents' bedroom. My friend left shortly after, and a few minutes after, my mom came home. She's yelling at me, saying something's happening, so I rush over to help. I hear the kitten crying for help under the bed, so I grab her, and she's foaming at the mouth. I've never been in a situation like this, so my first response that she was choking. I call the vet in a frenzy, and they tell me to bring her over. I later found out she was seizing, but she died in my arms when I was halfway to the vet. After we arrived back home, 
I'm telling my mom the story about how I thought she was home earlier and the light being on. She looked a bit confused, questioning about which light it was. I explained it was the light on her side of the headboard, and she stares at me blankly. That light has been dead for months. My grandma and grandpa live on a farm in the rural Midwest. My grandpa was actually born on the farm, and so was his father before him. The land has been in our family for well over a hundred years. Over the past 10 to 15 years, our family has had various experiences at the farm that are hard to explain. First, I should explain that the homestead portion of the farm has two houses on it, along with the barn, machine shed, etc. The newer, smaller house was built by my grandpa when he married my grandma, and they raised their family there. Probably 25 yards away from that house is the bigger, older house. This house is where my grandpa was born and grew up, as well as my great-grandpa Corwin. My mom recalls taking dinner over to her grandparents each evening, especially after my great-grandma passed away, and my great-grandpa Corwin was living on his own. Corwin was one of the kindest people I've known. He always wanted to take time to talk to people, and I remember he would always have those wafer cookies when he would come over to visit. He was an active man, and lived at the farm until he was in his 90s. Eventually, he was moved to a nursing home in a nearby town for a few years, until he passed away at the age of 94. Shortly after he passed away, my grandpa thought he heard his dad yelling his name. I recently read that this is a common phenomenon after a loved one passes away. My grandpa has also reported seeing lights on in the old house. One of my uncles lived in the old house for a short time after Corwin died. He's a highly skeptical person, but admits that he often heard strange noises and was once awoken by a loud bang. He was so startled that he actually grabbed his pistol and went to investigate. He found his basketball had fallen onto the floor from its usual place on a deep shelf. He wrote it off at the time, but admits that he sometimes wonders if it was his grandpa saying hello. The most startling encounters were had by my grandma and another uncle of mine. My great-grandpa Corwin loved to roam the farm and check on things. He did this until he moved to the nursing home. I can't count the number of times I remember watching him walking around the grounds with his cane in one hand and a handkerchief in the other. On separate occasions, they both saw a man in overalls and a flannel shirt walking around outside at night. They were both frightened when they saw him and initially didn't tell anyone about it. Eventually, my uncle mentioned it to my grandparents, and my grandma was shocked to hear he had a similar encounter to hers. She shared her story with him, and they agreed that it was probably Corwin. They were confused about why the encounter was so scary if it was Corwin, but chalked it up to being surprised at night. I've done some exploring of the house, but it's increasingly dangerous inside. I placed a recorder inside and left it there for 24 hours a couple of years ago, but never got around to reviewing whether it captured anything. I think partially out of fear of what I might hear. It's somewhat comforting to think it's just my great-grandpa Corwin chilling on the farm, the only home he ever knew. <laughs> <laughs> 